Hey, what's going on everybody? This is robwillis.info here, and in today's video, I'm going to be covering installing Elk 7, which is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana on Windows Server 2016. So if you've been around my channel for a minute, you may have noticed that I uh, I kind of do a lot of Elk videos installing on Windows, installing on Linux, and uh, in the previous Windows one, I did uh, Server 2012 R2, and uh, there was quite a few people that reached out to me and asked if I could do an updated version of um, the newest Elastic packages as well as a newer version of Windows Server. Uh, and so that's exactly what I'm going to cover in today. This will probably end up being my last Elk video because I plan on moving on to some new uh, subjects and whatnot. Um, but with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm actually going to be breaking this video up into two parts. Um, in the first part, I'm going to cover everything you need for the server itself. I'm going to cover installing and configuring Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana as Windows services. Um, I'm also going to cover installing Winlog Beat to forward logs um, from the Elk server into Elk. And then finally, I'm going to cover installing and configuring Curator, which is used to uh, maintain Elasticsearch in kind of the long term. And this will be used to delete old data once it reaches a certain criteria, like X amount of days old or whatever. Now, this step is optional. If you don't plan on having a long term running instance, you may not need to do this step, but it's a good thing to know how to do if, in case you do need to do that. And then, so part two will be covering a Windows 2016 client server. And in that video, I'm going to cover installing and configuring Winlog Beat. Uh, along with installing and configuring Sysmon, which is going to provide some additional information, some stuff that's useful, that it's kind of things you would typically see from EDR solutions, so like process creation events, um, network connections, those kind of things. And then finally, I'm going to show how to enable the uh, PowerShell logging. And then after that, we'll go ahead and update the win the WinLog beat configuration file to pick up not only the Windows event logs, but also the Sysmon events along with the PowerShell events, and then forward all that data over into the Elk instance. Now, I'm definitely going to try and keep this video as short as possible, but these can definitely end up being long videos. So if I cruise through things and you miss anything, please, you know, rewind. Um, there's also going to be a blog post that you'll see that I follow in the video that goes along with this, and I'll have links to all that stuff down below. All right, so for those of you who may not be familiar with the Elastic setup, I kind of want to do a basic uh, overview of the architecture real quick just to give you an idea how this is all going to be laid out. So if you notice, all the hosts are going to be on a single flat network. They're all going to be in the same subnet. Um, so all the hosts will be able to talk to each other um, over the network. So if you notice on the left hand side, we have clients running beats and those can be, you know, Windows Server 2016, Windows 10, you know, whatever, various Windows endpoints. And then on the right hand side, we have our Elk server over there running Windows Server 2016 as well. And so the beats agents are going to basically just forward events from the, the client servers into the Elastic stack. Now the beats agents that will be running on the servers, there's multiple beats agents that you can have for different types of logs. So in this case, I'm going to be using WinLog beat, which is going to forward the Windows events, the PowerShell events, and the Sysmon logs. And it's able to do all those logs because they're all going to end up in the Windows event viewer. So you can just pick them up with that single agent and then forward them over. Now, if you have some flat file logs like you would with IIS or DNS, AV, Windows updates, any of that kind of stuff, there's an additional agent that you can use called FileBeat. Now, there will be some additional parsing and stuff you'll need to do on those logs, but it's just a good thing to know that, you know, there's another agent available for those kind of logs. Um, but I'm not going to cover that in this video today. I'm only going to cover WinLogBeat. And then so you'll notice with the Elk server itself, it's going to be listening on the network on two separate ports. The first one's going to be Logstash running on port 5044. And uh, that's where all the uh, Beats agents are going to forward their data to. And then so Logstash will receive that data from the remote endpoints. And then it will go ahead and forward that data into the Elast Elasticsearch instance so it can be indexed and stored. And then the other port's going to be 5601, which is where Kaban is going to be running, which is going to be the web-based front end that we will use to search through the data that is stored in Elasticsearch. All right, so this next slide, I just kind of quickly want to talk about how I've spec'd out my VM for this video, uh, along with some server build notes and considerations that for whenever you start rolling these services on top of your own host. Um, so for my Elk server specs, you'll notice that I don't have anything really crazy going on here. It's a VM running on top of ESXi. Uh, it's got a host OS of Windows Server 2016. I've given it uh, three vCPUs, four gigabytes of memory, and 40 gigabytes of disk space. All right, so now there are a few things that you want to look out for when you start running these services long term on top of your own host. And one of the first things being uh, the Elastic services uh, are Java based. And if you've ever worked with Java applications, they tend to be memory hogs, especially as you start putting more and more of a load on them. Um, so the more memory you can throw at it, the better it's usually going to be. 
Um, also, be prepared to add storage as the amount of log types, the amount of hosts, the retention times, as all that stuff grows, you're going to need more storage for sure, um, especially if you plan on maintaining this thing long term. Um, and so because you're going to be searching through massive amounts of data in, you know, crazy increments like 30 days at a time, seven days at a time, any of that kind of stuff, that's a lot of data to search through. And the faster the storage is going to be, the faster your search is going to be. So definitely run SSDs where possible. And then the, uh, the final thing I want to say is the Elastic services are extremely scalable. And you may notice this as you see me going through this video and installing the services. I'm going to be installing all three services on top of one host. Um, but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. As your environment scales out, your Elastic or your Elk Stacks setup ends up scaling out as well. And you need to store more and be able to ingest more from more clients and all that stuff. You can break these services up very easily. Um, so you could actually have Logstash installed on a set of servers, Kibana installed on a separate set of servers, and then even have an Elasticsearch cluster running the back end. Um, so definitely keep that in mind as you see me going through this and how you could apply this to your environment if you need to scale these things out. Um, they're, they're extremely flexible in, in that matter. Um, the only thing you really need to have is network connectivity between all these services, and that's it. And so this last slide here, I just want to kind of quickly show what the uh, Kibana interface looks like and what we're working towards here once we have the Windows event logs flowing into it. Um, but you'll notice that there's all kind of fields on the left hand side that you can kind of break your searches down and get like very granular with it basically. And um, it definitely allows you to rapidly triage and troubleshoot issues along with like you can do like threat hunting, uh, statistical analysis, any of those kind of things. Um, but basically there's all kind of ways to search through your data and find what you're looking for. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started on setting up this Elk stack and installing these services. All right, so I've gone ahead and logged into my Windows 2016 server. That's going to be the uh, the Elk stack. And you'll see I've got my blog post pulled up here along with all of the uh, all the other tabs at the top there for all the installs. Um, but the blog post will have links to all of the packages you'll need to get along with the configuration files, commands, and all those things. And I'll have links to the blog post down below. So the first thing we're going to need to do is get Java. And I'm going to grab the 64-bit uh, package because it's a 64-bit OS. And then next we're off to the Elastic website. I'm going to grab the MSI version of the Elastic Search installer. And then for Logstash, I'm going to grab the uh, zip package there. For Kibana, I'm going to grab the Windows package there. And then next up is WinLogBeat. And again, 64-bit OS. I'm going to grab the 64-bit uh, version of that. And then the last one we're going to get from Elastic is going to be the curate, Curator package, which is also going to be in MSI format. So some of these packages like Elasticsearch will basically automatically create its own service on Windows and there's nothing else you need to do. Um, but unfortunately that's not the case with all of these. So like Logstash and Kibana for example, um, they don't create their own services. So that's where an SSM comes in, the non-sucking service manager. I'm basically going to use that to manually create the Logstash and Kibana services. So I've already gone ahead and downloaded all of the packages already and uh, we're basically ready to go. And uh, so like I said, this is going to go hand in hand with the blog post I have and the uh, the first thing we're going to be doing is prepping the server by installing uh, Java and configuring an environmental variable. Alright so the first thing I'm going to do is double click the Java installation package and run that and I'm going to check this little box here that says change the destination folder and that's really just to show you the, uh, the installation path of Java because we're going to need that for the next step um, but you'll see it's going to install the program files Java and JRE. Um, so once this is completed, we need to create an environmental variable named Java Home, and that way um, Elasticsearch will know where Java is installed in order for it to run. So uh, once this is completed, we'll go ahead and pick up from there. All right, so it looks like it's just about done. And okay, and I'm going to go ahead and click close, and then I'm going to go down here to my little Windows icon, and I'm going to pull up System, and then you'll see on the left-hand side here, Advanced System Settings. I'm going to go ahead and click on that, and then Environment Variables. And then down here on underneath system variables, I'm going to create a new one named Java underscore home. And then I'm going to browse for directory and I'm going to point it to the path of the uh, Java installation. And just give me a second to drill down here, but we're going to go all the way to the JRE folder and then click OK. And then after that, you just OK out of everything and close all your windows basically. And then we're gonna have to reboot the server for the uh, the variable to be picked up. So we're gonna go ahead and reboot the server now and we'll pick up once the server's back up. 
Alright, so the server's back up and running at this point, and um, basically I've already gone ahead and pulled everything up that I had up before the server was rebooted, so I've got my uh, blog post here with all the steps needed to do the installation, and then I've also pulled up the folder with all of the downloads. Um, so with that being said, we're just going to go ahead and get started by double-clicking on the MSI package downloaded from Elastic, and um, this is one of the few services from Elastic, actually it's the only one, that's going to um, install as a Windows service right out of the gate. So I'm going to go ahead and click run and kick off the installer. And so the Elasticsearch install is going to be super straightforward. I'm going to use all the default directories. Um, it is worth noting that the data directory is configurable at this point. So if you plan on having a large install or, uh, or you plan on storing a lot of data, um, you could change that now and you could actually point it to another drive or whatever you want. But it's just something to know that you could do in the beginning. And I'm just going to follow the default settings here. I'm going to install as a service using local system. Make sure the services start with Windows automatically. Uh, as far as like all the settings here, the cluster name, node name, all that stuff, I'm just going to follow the defaults. Notice that HTTP port is 9200. We're going to need to reference that later on. Uh, as far as the plugins for the XPack, uh, I'm not going to check any of these options, um, but they're worth looking at some of them. There's some pretty cool stuff you can do there. And then as far as the license, I'm just going to stick with the basic one. Uh, there is a trial one where you can install some advanced features like the machine learning, graphing, alerting, some security stuff and, and whatnot. But like I said, I'm just going to stick with the basic one now because that's all we need. And then uh, let it go ahead and install and we'll pick up from there. All right, so I think the installer is just about finished here. And OK, so there we go. We see Elasticsearch is installed successfully. And so the next thing we need to do is test Elasticsearch and make sure that it's actually up and running. Um, so there's two ways to do this. Um, so Elasticsearch uses a RESTful API. So one of the things you can do is just browse to it and do localhost and specify that port of 9200 because we saw that's what it's running on. And we see it returns some JSON data for us here. And um, then the other thing you could do is pull up a PowerShell console. And there's a, a commandlet called invoke dash rest method and you can do that and then specify that same URL of HTTP localhost and that port 9200 and we should see that it will, re it will return some similar data and we see that tagline you know for search and uh, so that's it Elasticsearch is successfully installed and up and running at this point and now we can go ahead and move on to the next step which is going to be installing Logstash. Unfortunately, the Logstash package isn't quite as easy to install as the Elasticsearch one is. Um, so basically what we're going to have to do here is the zip file that we downloaded from Elastic. I'm going to have to extract that and then copy and paste it into what's going to be its permanent home. Um, so in this case, I'm going to use program data. So C program data, which actually ends up being a hidden folder. Um, so if you don't know how to, to get that, you just go view and then options and then click on view and then show hidden files and folders. I also like to um, show the uh, extensions for files as well. Um, but inside program data, I'm going to go to Elastic, and you see Elasticsearch already has a folder there. So I'm just going to copy and paste my uh, Logstash folder and paste it directly into there. Now Logstash does require a configuration file, and I'm going to have a sample one on my website you can download and use, and it'll be exactly as I'm using in this setup. But I'm going to copy that conf file into the config directory, and you'll notice there is a logstash-sample.conf that you can also use that to reference. Um, but in this case, mine's going to be set up specifically for the Beats agents along with the timestamp that I'm going to be expecting to use that I'm going to tie into um, Curator later on. Um, but that's it. You can see it's a pretty simple, straightforward configuration file, um, but it is needed for Logstash. So one other thing I want to mention about that timestamp real quick about why I chose that one specifically with the weeks instead of the days is to help keep the uh, shards down on the Elasticsearch side because if you go if you end up with too many shards over time uh, it can actually end up Im impacting Elasticsearch. Uh, so with that being said I'm going to move on to uh, NSSM and I basically just unzipped it and I'm going to pull up a command prompt and cd to the directory there. Um, but this is a we're going to have to kick this off through the command line and then it'll pop the GUI and we can set up the Logstash service. So I'm just going to cd to downloads, um, my NSSM folder, and then the 64-bit one because I'm on a 64-bit OS, and that's it. And we see that if I do a dir real quick, that's exactly where the executable is. All right, so now you may have noticed that I actually opened a PowerShell window rather than a command prompt window. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can do it either way. Um, but sometimes PowerShell gets a little funky when you try to um, run you know, good old executable commands. So in this case, I'm going to use start-process. 
um, which I believe is one of the newer versions of PowerShell introduced that commandlet. Um, but I'm going to call the nssm.exe and then install logstash. Um, so if you run into issues with this command specifically, I'd go ahead and just use regular old cmd.exe. Um, but you notice that I'm going to copy some of these settings here and just plug them in directly, basically. Um, so for the path, I'm just going to point it to that folder that I copy and pasted the uh, the uh, archive that I extracted earlier and see program data, elastic, and logstash. And I'm going to point it to the uh, bin directory here. And we've got the logstash.bat, and that's what we're going to use to uh, start the service. All right, so now that I got that info plugged in, the uh, next thing I need to do is define the argument. And I'm just going to do a dash F and then basically just point it to the configuration file. And that's going to be the file that I downloaded from my website earlier, the logstash.conf. Uh, which is going to be inside that C program data directory and you want to make sure that you get this one right too if you notice that when I copy and pasted it from the website it actually had a path of uh, logstash-7.0.0 and it looks like they uh, actually updated that package so make sure you get the right directories there uh, for the service name I'm just going to name it logstash and that's what we'll see in the uh, services later on it'll be named that and then lastly, we want to set a dependency of Elasticsearch, and that's going to set it up so that uh, Logstash won't start unless um, Elasticsearch is already up and running, which is the way we want it to be. And then click Install Service, and you see that it installs the service successfully. So next up, I want to pull up services.msc and uh, see if I can see that service and uh, hopefully start it. All right, so we see that it did create the service successfully, and I'm just going to go ahead and right-click and start that. And then I'm actually going to go ahead and right click and refresh this window just to make sure that the service stayed up and running because sometimes misconfigured services have a tendency to start and then stop right away. Um, but so the last thing we want to do here is make sure that we um, are allowing the inbound connections to this service. So since Logstash is going to be listening on port 5044, I'm just going to create an inbound uh, firewall rule for the Windows firewall. Um, to allow these connections. Um, so, yep, that's it. Basically, just copy and paste that command, and then I want to pull up the uh, wf.msc, which is just the Windows firewall, and take a look at the inbound rules and verify that it created that logstash role. And that's it. So now the server will uh, be listening on port 5044. That will be exposed to uh, external clients on the network, and it will be able to receive connections from those clients and receive the data that they're sending on in. All right, so now that Logstash is installed, it's time to move on to installing Kibana. And uh, the Kibana installation is going to be basically exactly the same as the Logstash one. Um, it starts out with a zip archive that needs to be extracted and then uh, copy and paste it into its permanent home. So you can see all I've done so far is just right click, extracted that zip archive, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cut that folder and paste it over into the same directory that I put Elasticsearch and, uh, and Logstash. And that's going to be C program data. And I'm just going to paste it directly into there, and that's where Kibana is going to permanently live. All right, so now that I got that folder copied over, um, like I said, the install process is going to be basically exactly the same as Logstash. So you see that I'm still in the, uh, the NSSM directory, and I'm going to use a very similar command. I'm going to start process, calling nssm.exe, and then install Kibana. And I'm just going to go ahead and copy that, copy and paste that command into PowerShell here and kick off the NSSM installer. I do want to mention though, make sure that you're still in the same directory that the nssm.exe is located. Um, so, and with that being said, the configuration portion is going to be pretty much exactly the same as Logstash. I'm going to point it to Elastic. Uh, let's get into the Kibana directory and the bin, and I'm going to call the kibana.bat, just like we did with the logstash.bat. Um, but you see the full directory here, and like I said, I'm pointing it to the kibana.bat. And uh, there's no arguments for this one. I'm just going to name the service Kibana. And then uh, as far as the dependencies go, I'm going to set Elasticsearch and Logstash this time because we want to make sure that both of those services are started before Kibana is started. And that's it. Click Install Service, and we see that it installs the service successfully. All right, and just like the Logstash service, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the services.msc and verify that it did create the service successfully. And we see the Kibana service there. Um, but you know what, before I actually start that service, let's go take a look at the configuration file real quick because there's two things I want to talk about that are in there. And uh, you see that I'm just going to go to the uh, Kibana installation directory in that config folder. And I'm going to right click on the kibana.yaml. And in this case, I'm actually going to open it with Notepad++. Uh, but you see the server port of 5601. 
and then the server.host, which is pointing to localhost right now. So I'm just going to uncomment the uh, server port, so we make sure that it runs on that port. And then for the server.host, I'm actually going to set it to uh, 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. And that's going to ensure that the server is listening on all IP addresses of the server. Um, so this way, remote clients can, can connect to our Kibana instance by specifying the IP address of the host and that port of 5601. And uh, that's it. And I'm just going to go ahead and save that configuration file, and then we should be good to go uh, with the, uh, starting the service up. And so just like we saw with the log dash service, um, if we're going to be receiving connections from remote clients, we need to make sure that we poke a hole in the firewall for this one. And so I'm just going to use this command here to open up uh, port 5601 on the Windows firewall. And I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste that into there. And then hit enter. And we see that it creates the firewall rule OK. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the uh, Windows firewall in the GUI and just verify that it did actually create that successfully. And I'll just have to refresh that real quick. Um, but we see both of our rules are there. So now we should be able to have remote clients connecting to the server on that port and everything should be all good. So Kibana is a web-based front end. So that means that we can just browse to it and verify that it's actually up and running. So I'm just going to go uh, pull up Firefox and do localhost and specify port 5601. And we see that it loads the Kibana instance successfully. Um, so this is where we're going to be able to search for and search through all of the data that is in the Elasticsearch instance. And uh, that's really it. So at this point, we've got the Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana up and running on our server. And so the next thing we need to do is start getting some data into the Elk instance. All right, so now it's time to install uh, WinLogBeat and get some data flowing into the Elk, ins Elk instance itself. Um, so just like the other packages, I'm going to uh, copy and paste the folder that I've already extracted from the zip archive that I downloaded from Elastic. And I'm just going to paste it into C Program Data Elastic along with all of my other installations. And I'm going to go ahead and get into that directory and then we want to check out the winlogbeat.yml. And um, there's actually a few things that we want to take note of in this configuration file. So the first thing is going to be the uh, win log beat uh, event underscore logs, and that's going to define what logs we're going to forward to the Elk instance. So by default, it's going to be application, security, and system, which is perfect for now. So we're just going to leave those alone. Um, but if you scroll down a little bit, you'll notice the elastic search output section. Um, we're going to be sending the data into Logstash, so I need to comment out the output along with the host entry here. And uh, if you notice right below that, there's actually the Logstash output, and that's what we're going to be utilizing in this one. So I'm going to uncomment the output and then uncomment the host as well. And then I'm going to swap out that local host for the IP address of the Elk server itself and specifying port 5044 because that's where Logstash is going to be listening. All right, so with the uh, configuration file all set, the next thing we need to do is install the service. And you'll notice that there's an install service win log beat PowerShell script here. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up PowerShell and then you got to CD over to the directory so that we can uh, just call the PowerShell script directly. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and CD to C program data and then elastic and win log beat. And I'll run dir real quick just to make sure I'm in the right directory. And we see that install service PS1 script there. And now I'm just going to do PowerShell.exe, uh, execution policy, bypass, so that way we don't bang off of that. And then just call the installation script directly. And that's it. It'll go ahead and create the uh, WinLogBeat uh, service for us, and that'll be it. It'll just run with Windows whenever it starts up, and we'll be good to go there. So we don't have to use NSSM or anything like that in this case. All right, so we see that it looks like it installed the service successfully. Um, so just like the previous time, I'm going to go ahead and pull up services.msc. I'm going to refresh it real quick and see if we can locate that WinLogBeat service. And uh, there it is. So I'm just going to right-click and start that guy. And I'm also going to refresh it real quick just to make sure that it actually stays up and running since we did modify that configuration file. Um, but it does. It looks like it's still up and running. And that's it. So now we have WinLogBeat uh, successfully installed on our server, and it should be picking up our local Windows event logs. All right, so at this point, we've got the Elastic Stack fully up and configured. We've got WinLogBeat running on the local host, forwarding logs into Logstash. And um, the server's already been up and running for a little bit, so I'm just going to go ahead and pull up Event Viewer real quick and just show you the logs that I'm talking about. So we got the Windows logs, the application security and system ones, and um, since the host has been up for a little bit, there's already data in there, so it should just be, WinLogBeat should just be forwarding that data into our Elastic instance. So there should already be data available for us to search through. 
Um, but before we do that, we need to go to Management, Index Patterns, and we need to tell Kibana where to find this data. So you see right off the bat, it already finds some data. Um, but we need to find the index pattern, which is just going to be winlogbeat-wildcard. And you'll see that it's going to it matches successfully, and that's because it's going to be winlogbeat- and then the date and the timestamp, basically. Um, so that's it. I'm going to click Next. And then for our time filter field name, I'm just going to use at timestamp. And then I'm going to go ahead and create, click on create index pattern. All right, so we see that it creates the index pattern successfully. And um, right off the bat, it starts parsing out some of the fields that are available from that data in those logs. Now, from time to time, as you add new logs in here with additional fields, you may have to come in here and refresh the field list. Um, so like as we add the PowerShell logs and things like that, you might want to come back and do that. Um, but let's go ahead and head over to the Discover button here, and you'll see that there's already um, a good bit of Windows logs just flowing into the server. And I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of that banner real quick. <clears throat> um, but you'll see here that these are actual Windows events, and we can break these things down based off of the fields that are available on the left-hand side here. And it'll be things like host name, uh, event code, or event ID, um, host architecture, host OS, those kind of things. Um, but all this data is being parsed out from these event logs. And we can break things down um, based off of those fields directly on the left hand side here. Like as we get more data in there, you'll see that it'll actually show you like the top five um, you know, events or whatever that are coming from that particular field as we expand those things. Or you can just go ahead and start searching against the data directly. So the other thing I want to mention here is that your searches are typically going to be tied to a time frame, you know, uh, like in this case, event 4624 Windows logins over the last day, um, last week or whatever. And we can kind of do statistical analysis against that, or we can also just do some threat hunting and looking for anomalies and digging through that data there. But you'll see that it's structured very similar to how it would be in the uh, Windows event viewer, but a lot of that data is parsed out. And then we have a full message there that would be very similar to what we would see in the event viewer. And all of this data is going to be stored inside the Elasticsearch instance, and it'll be there permanently and basically until we intervene with it. So whereas the normal Windows event viewer logs will roll over after a specific time or once the log reaches a certain size, this data will be stored as long as we want it to be unless we tell it to do otherwise. So this also ends up becoming a little bit of a problem for the Elk stack as there's no built-in way or native functionality to maintain the disk space and, and the data that's going into the Elasticsearch instance. So that's where a curator comes in for us and that's why I want to talk about this because it's much easier to set this up ahead of time uh, rather than let the server fill up its disk and crash and then try and recover it after the fact. Um, so the install is going to be pretty straightforward. Um, there's an MSI package available, and there's also going to be two configuration files that I'll have links to uh, on my website that you can download. Um, but there's going to be, uh, so uh, the Elasticsearch curator is going to install the program files, Elasticsearch-curator. Uh, and those two configuration files are going to be, one of them is going to be for uh, curator itself, and then the other one's going to be an actions file. That's going to say what to delete and when to delete it. All right, and so now that that's installed, I'm just going to go ahead and navigate over to the program files and the Elasticsearch curator folder, and I'm just going to paste my configuration files directly into there. And then I'm going to go ahead and pull up a command prompt because uh, this is a command line utility. So you want to make sure that you test it uh, at, at the command line prior to setting it up as a scheduled task. And so I'm just going to copy this command here and then pull up that command prompt. And um, I, sometimes I prefer to use um, Command Prompt rather than PowerShell. And this is one of the specific situations with these um, having multiple arguments and spaces in between there. It's a little bit easier and predictable to run it at a Command Prompt. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull that up real quick. But you'll see that we've got curator.exe um, dash config calling that configuration file. And then I've got the dry run in there too. So that way it won't delete. Oh, you see I ran to the issue. So it looks like that actually it should be a dash dash config and a dash dash drive run. So it's the way it copy and paste it. I'll make sure I update the blog post to uh, kind of resolve that issue. Um, but basically this is going to do a dry run and it's going to tell us what data it would delete if we would have told it to delete it. And you see that it did actually find some data. So in this case, um, I have the uh, actions file set to data older than 60 days. So it did actually identify some data that was older than that. And if we would have not used the dry option, the dry run option, it would have deleted that data. Um, so at this point, you could go ahead and use this to uh, basically become your scheduled task. So since we know it's working correctly, and just remove that uh, dry run option. Um, but since this is just a demo video, I'm going to actually go ahead and remove that dry run option and show that it does actually delete that data as we expect it to. 
and we see that it does and I'll go ahead and rerun it again with the drive run and see if it identifies any additional data and it doesn't because it did actually delete that data and that's it so uh, now that we know this is a bit of a polished command we can go ahead and set it up as a scheduled task to run daily and it'll just maintain our instance deleting data that's older than 60 days all right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and copy and paste this command here, but it's gonna create a scheduled task on this machine running at the system level of permissions, and it's gonna be named curator cleanup. And it's gonna call our configuration file with our actions file, and basically just kick off curator exactly as we just did, and it's gonna run it every day at midnight. And that's it. So now the Elastic the, uh, the Elk instance will basically maintain itself. Um, so you will want to still monitor the server and make sure that you have enough disk space available for your retention time and kind of adjust that. You're going to e either need to add more disk space or subtract some time uh, depending on what your needs are. Uh, but you can see here that it did actually create that task successfully and we can kind of see it and monitor it through there and make sure that it's actually running. Um, but that's it. So the Elk instance will now maintain itself and we can kind of, you know, um, make sure that we have the amount of data that we want in there and that it's available without filling up the disk and crashing the server. All right, so that's pretty much it. So we've got an Elastic instance up and running on Windows Server 2016. We've got logs flowing in from the local instance to itself. And um, I just want to show you something real quick. But if you look at this and I remove the search option for that specific event ID, just refresh my search real quick here. Um, check this out. So the event codes, it actually shows you the top five event codes that are coming into the instance just like that. So as you can imagine, the use cases for this are pretty much limitless, especially when it comes to your engineering, administration, architecture teams, you know, the kind of people who are reviewing logs on the daily. Not only does it allow them to rapidly search through the data and triage issues, but it also enables them to do it at scale from a central location, all while having no associated licensing fees. So you can basically store as much data for as long as you want, assuming you have the disk space available. And in this video, I only covered the Windows logs, but you could also bring in your web server logs and any other kind of logs you could think of really, and then you could build dashboards and reports around that data, and basically have an unprecedented level of visibility into what's going on in your environment at any any given time. Whew. So uh, yeah, I knew that was going to be a long one. I, uh, I tried to knock that out as uh, quick as possible while still being thorough and explaining things, you know, uh, rather well. Um, but so at this point, we got a uh, elk stack up and running. We got the win log beat uh, running on it and forwarding all the uh, normal Windows event logs into the elk instance. And we also have curator up and running and maintaining our Elasticsearch instance and deleting data older than 60 days. And so in the next video, which is definitely going to be considerably shorter, I'm going to cover setting up another Windows Server 2016 to act as a client server and report back to the Elk instance that we created in this video. And in that video, I'm going to cover installing WinLogBeat, much like I did in this video, to pick up the normal you know, application system and security logs from Windows. Um, but in addition to that, I'm also going to cover installing uh, um, Sysmon along with a configuration file and uh, that's going to provide some additional information the stuff kind of stuff that you would typically see associated with like a EDR solution um, so like process creation events network connections things like that and then I'm also going to cover uh, enabling the PowerShell logging so like script block logging and the module logging and then show how to update the WinLogBeat configuration file to pick up those events and uh, send them on over into the Elk instance so that it'll pick up those logs along with the Sysmon logs all with the one beats agent so as always, I thank you guys for watching. Hope you found out something useful in this video and I'll see you next time.